them for his group. So he chooses them, he calls them unto himself as a special nation, which no other nation has, and we'll see that as we get further along in our in our study. He calls them into a covenant relationship, and then as we go on, we'll we'll look more at this. But last week, we uh, we started on an area that we need to really look at and think about because it's not one that's talked about too much directly because it's so controversial, and there are a lot of people who will not like this uh, study. But we uh, started into it, and so we just wanted to kind of try to go through it scripturally and see where we fall. And uh, uh, so as, as much as you'd like to, I would like for you to comment uh, in regard to the questions. If you have your outline, if you go on to your outline on, on the webpage, you can see where we're at. We're looking at the, the divine or sovereign reprobation, which includes the will to permit a person to fall into sin and then to impose the punishment of damnation on account of that sin. So God can allow people uh, to be born in sin, and of course they're guilty of sin, and the wages of sin is death, and so we're kind of hit already, right? So it's kind of a, a struggle there when you think about that. We talked about the decrees of God, how they are eternal, wise, free, and unconditional, and how God carries out those decrees through his acts of providence his uh, wise, powerful, preserving, and governing of all his creatures and all their actions. We talked about how the opposite of what we'll be looking at, sovereign uh, damnation, is the election unto salvation, right? People have a problem with election unto salvation, and now we're getting into the opposite of that, and that is a rejection unto damnation. And so, of course, the question is, does God harden People's hearts, that's what we wanted to know. Does God actively harden people's hearts? What does that hardening mean scripturally in the Old Testament, in the New Testament? What does it mean? Can those people ever be saved? And here's, here's the key why I bring this up. I want you to know that I have an understanding and why I'm presenting things the way I am. What about Israel? Because there are some who say there is no Israel, there's only the church which means God has hardened them to the point where he will not. And I'll show you that. And in showing you that, I'm not, uh, I'm not calling out these people as far as I think they're false teachers they're, um, or they're bad people. But I want you to understand that we don't all, right? I don't know if you know that. But in case you didn't know that and you're new here, we don't all agree. Right, R.C. Sproul doesn't agree with John MacArthur. John MacArthur doesn't uh, agree with League and Duncan, so on and so forth. And we all have different perspectives, right? And so I just want you to be aware of those things. And so if you could, let me just take you through some scriptures to uh, sort of um, refresh your memory on this. Deuteronomy chapter 2 is one place, and I can just read this, and there are multiple places, and I won't go to all of them. But I just want to sort of whet your appetite and get you to, your mind thinking here. But in Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 30, we read this. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, was not willing for us to pass through his land. For Yahweh, your God, stiffened his spirit and made his heart obstinate in order to your hand as he is today. That's pretty clear. You see that in verse 30 there? God had stiffened his spirit and made his heart obstinate. Why? In order to give him over into your hand. Did God do that? Didn't he actively do that? Which is it? Right? That's what we want to know. It's what we need to find out. Uh, if you go to Exodus, and I'm obviously not going to read all the passages that deal with this, but just... I can just give you one, Exodus 4, it's in chapter 7, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, 14, so on and so forth. But in Exodus chapter 4, it's the first time that God talks about his relationship with Pharaoh in that he hardens Pharaoh's heart. So Exodus chapter 4, verse 21, Yahweh said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, 
See to it that all the miraculous wonders which I put in your hand, that you do them before Pharaoh. But as for me, I will harden his heart with strength so that he will not let the people go. I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. And of course, he does let the people go. And after he lets them go, he starts thinking, who's going to do all the work around here? Because the, the Hebrews are the ones that have been doing all the work. So now we're going to have to go back and we're going to have to get them back so we can get the work done. So does God harden people's hearts or does he not harden people's hearts? A little bit later on in chapter 9 in verse 34, let me read this for you. Hopefully my voice will last. But Pharaoh saw, this is verse 34 of chapter 9, but Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and the thunder had ceased so he sinned again and hardened his heart with firmness, he and his servants. So now all of the Egyptians are mad. And of course, God softens their hearts and gives them a, a love for God's people to give them what they need to get them out of the, the land there, right? So what does it mean to harden somebody's heart? Well, we know that Satan hardens hearts, right? Look at 2 Corinthians or you can just write the passage down. Many of you know this. Uh, it was brought out last week. And again, we want to know, God does harden hearts. The Bible says that God does harden hearts, but how does he do it? Does he actively do that, right? So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 say this, And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So Satan blinds the minds of the unbelievers. Their minds are blinded. And we're going to see that again. I just want to try to refresh your memory as to where we are. So Satan blinds their minds. God is said to harden their hearts and stiffen their necks against him, right? Uh, sin also hardens. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3, and I think it's verse 14, if you want to turn there, or it might be 313. Yeah, but encourage one another after the... Day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by what? By the deceitfulness of sin. Sin hardens you. You're already hardened. God hardens. Satan hardens. Uh, what's your view on that? I mean, think about it this way. Um, listen to, uh, um, let's see. Let me find something. Let me do Ephesians. I'll just do Ephesians. That's a familiar one. Ephesians 4.18. I want you to get this in your mind and, and see if you can wrap your mind around this. Elena or uh, Megan and I were talking last night. And, of course, she's sick this morning, but she had to do her uh, write her testimony. She was going to give her testimony to some of the girls. Now, I realize a lot of girls are raised in church in here. Our church is different from a lot of churches. I don't know if everybody's as familiar with it as I am, but a lot of Kids here are homeschooled. A lot of them uh, pal around together, hang around together. And so they have a different outlook on life. They're not as exposed to sin as some of us were growing up in the world. And so uh, sometimes, and I don't say this, um, I say this to sort of maybe be preventative for you. It's very important that you understand where you are in your relationship with the Lord. It's very important that you understand uh, your your sinful attitude. Ephesians 4.18 says, being darkened in their mind, alienated, that's perfect tense, they, they have been and they continue to be alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. So you are born with a hard heart, you cannot see, you are dead, Satan blinds you, sin blinds you, and God blinds you. Now, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, can you get the mic over to Randy? Did you get...
get another mic? Or we'll, yeah, you'll need that, uh, definitely. We have to keep him on his toes back here. He wasn't ready. So we're trying to break him in. So, I mean, think of all the obstacles that you're thinking about here, facing all You're born blind, sin blinds, Satan blinds, God blinds, and yet somehow you're saved. Is that by your own effort? Yeah, I'm not sure that it was worth the wait for this, for what I was going to say. But, but I was just going to say that it almost seems like it's a, it takes a monogistic, one-sided, gracious act of God to save us. What do you mean by monergistic? Yeah. Uh, one. For, for not everybody knows one, that. As I said, one-sided, uh, singly, single acted by God for us to be saved. Because we're dead. We're sinful. All these things are against us. I'm not going to turn around and, and, and choose him. So it, it takes an effort, on uh, a first effort on his part, and an only effort, a first, middle, end. Now, how, now, I agree with that. How many of you would disagree that it takes a, a single work of God to first, can I say, quicken your heart, generate your heart in order for you to repent and believe? How many of you would have a problem with that? It's kind of difficult when you think about it. Because there is nothing in us. We're blind. Sin blinds us. Satan blinds us. God blinds us. How do you get saved? By an act of your own goodness, right? So it's, and then of course the original question go, comes back to, what about Israel? Is Israel so hard to get them off, and that's it? And now it's just for the church, and we're gonna we're gonna look at that uh, here shortly. But we we left off last time looking at what the original condition, <laughs> excuse me, of the sinner is. He's dead in his trespasses and sins in John 5, 24. He's deaf to the truth. He cannot hear. John uh, 8, 43, Jesus said, you cannot hear me. You cannot hear my words because you are not my sheep. They're blind to their sin. They're enslaved to their fallen uh, sinful nature as, as such. And then this is where we came last time. So, <coughs> excuse me. So not only is it bad enough that that blindness is there, there's more. There's more blindness. If you look at Deuteronomy, look at Deuteronomy. You'll probably know these verses when we start. Chapter 13, you should know this, Deuteronomy chapter 13. <coughs> Excuse me. Deuteronomy chapter 13. On your outline, this is number two. It's false teachers. False teachers we're talking about here. Sinners' original condition, we've looked at that. And now we're looking at the false teachers who will guide them in their further blindness and then see, uh, again, what part God plays uh, in that. False teachers. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams rises among you and give you a sign or wonder, the sign or wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying... Let us walk after other gods whom you've not known, and let us serve them. You should not listen to the words of that prophet or the dreamer of dreams. For Yahweh, your God, is doing what? He's testing you to find out if you love Yahweh, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul. Listen to me. God brings people into your lives that are false. Do you understand that? When you have people in your life create your life and are bringing you teaching that kind of makes you feel uneasy and uncomfortable, that you can't reconcile, there's a reason for that. It's a sovereign act of God. Everything that happens in our life is God-filtered, Father-filtered. You see that? You can see the same thing in, uh, uh, well, Matthew 24, 24. That's the passage that I was thinking about earlier. And you find the same thing in uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 19. But in uh, Matthew 24, 24, he says this, For false Christs and false prophets, this is Jesus' 
prophesying of what would happen. They will great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So now these teachers who are coming into the system and trying to lead people astray as well. Thank you. So now we have false teachers. Now, who sends these false teachers? Well, God sends these false teachers. And what do they do? They lead people into further blindness. Going back to the text that we looked at earlier, it's quoted several times over in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, if you will. Just kind of listen along and follow along if, you're, if you have your outline there. But Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Just read those verses for you, and then we'll try to get a little bit further. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. He said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not know. Render the heart insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return to be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he said, until the cities are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is devastated to desolation. And what are they giving the people? The truth. The very thing they need the most is what they're giving them. And they're giving them that truth, and instead of that truth, regenerating them is hardening them. It's hardening them. You see the hardness that's happening? And yet we are here saved by the grace of God. Not because we were raised in a Christian home, not because we read our Bible and say our prayers and do those sorts of things, but it's all a monergistic work of God in our hearts. See that? Uh, and you can look at various other passages there. John 12, uh, verse 40, Matthew 13, 15, and many other verses that I, I won't go into for time's sake. But I did want to get to this one part, and that has to do with God's place uh, in hardening here, right? We looked at it in Exodus, and we've seen in chapter 7, 9, uh, 14, and other places where God hardens hearts. But then look at Romans chapter 1, and I hope you're, I hope you're uh, sort of gearing up to make some comments here because I, I'm having a, a very difficult time thinking about this and how, it re, how it, I should respond to this. But in Romans chapter 1, I'll just give you three verses. You know which ones they are, 24, 26, and 28. Romans chapter 1, and notice verse 24. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. So God gives them over. They see the creation of God. They don't acknowledge the creator. They would rather serve the creature than the creator. Same thing Adam and them did, right? They were supposed to govern the land. They're supposed to control the beasts. And then they're listening to the beasts. Now here... The same thing is going on in this sort of cycle. God then gives them over or gives them up. And then notice verse 26 again. It says, for this reason God gave them over to dishonorable passions where their females exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural in the same way. Also the males abandoned the natural function of the female and burned in their desire toward one another, males with males committing indecent acts and receiving their own persons the due penalty of their error. And you have that in the pulpit today. Homosexual and lesbian pastors. And it's acceptable. And it's promoted. Does that offend you? I don't know if it offends you. It offends me. I mean, I, I love those people. I pray for those people. I know only God can quicken their hearts, but it's extremely, extremely offensive to me. And uh, I don't mind showing my agitation every once in a while. But uh, look, look at verse 28 then. 
And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to an unfit or reprobate mind to do those things which are not proper. An unfit mind. It's like the draw. It's the, the sludge that you dis, discard, that you throw out. God had given them over to a, a reprobate mind, a useless mind. What's your thoughts on that? Any, any responses so far? Yeah, Dave. As difficult as it is to process this in my mind, I know that God has said that his word will not return void. So when his word goes out, it will do its work. And that work isn't always to bring people to faith. Sad truth. Anybody else? Yeah. If you're real short, raise your hand up real high. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the contrast again. We were talking about last week, uh, contrast between the good and the evil. God shows his uh, greatness and awesomeness through how depraved people can be and he turns them over to that so that he could show his judgment and, and how holy and righteous he is. Romans chapter 11 verses 7 and 8 Roman 11, Romans 11 7 and 8. What then what Israel is seeking it is not but the chosen obtained it. What about the rest? They were hardened. Just as it's written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, ears to hear not, down to this very day. I don't know how that affects you. That bothers me. The thought that God sends them a spirit of stupor, that they can't see, they can't hear, they can't believe. Let me ask you a question, just out of curiosity. What impact does this have on you? You have friends, you have family, you have loved ones, you have relatives that you've cried over and prayed over and they're not yet saved. And knowing all this, that God is actively, possibly hardening their heart, how do you respond to that? How does that make you feel? Yeah, hang on just a second. We'll get you guys the mics. Uh, two things. First of all, it makes me extremely great, grateful for God's grace in my own life because um, I could be all that and more. Um, secondly, in evangelism, uh, sharing the gospel, um, it's made me taking a burden off my shoulders. It's, you know, I pray for uh, you know, our two daughters not following Christ. I pray for them, share with them when I can. But ultimately, knowing that God has to change their hearts, I don't have to. It's not some slick appeal on my behalf or some great metaphor or analogy. God has to supernaturally awaken them. Um, and that's, it's like, hey, I just have to share the word. And it's like Dave said, uh, his word will go forth and have its whatever word. Now, now how does do. that help you feeling that way? You said you don't feel burdened, that because you don't it, get people saved. Right, because it's, I can't save nobody. I can't save myself, let, us, let alone my own kids or anyone else, but God's word is actively working, and we know that, and um, we just leave his sovereignty up to himself, and that, that's, that's good. It's because it's not based upon some slick appeal by me or getting it all right or, oh, I said this wrong, I should have said this, you know what I mean? It makes it, it, makes it much easier to share the gospel to, it, for me. So now I don't know how many of you have different, I know all of you have different backgrounds somewhat, but I'm, I'm, I'm from an independent King James Fundamental Baptist Church, which you should be able to save a chicken. I mean, you got to give every, everybody the gospel, you know, constantly pressing that motive all the time. And there's a great stress put on people in those sort of sects in order to get people to say, yeah, I believe. See? Great stress. There's a couple over here, yeah. Kathy and then I think... Yeah. I don't have any problem following. It, it's easy for me to see how my own heart leads me. Could you speak to, up just a little bit? Oh, sure. It's easy for me to see how my own heart um, 
was hardened and how God softened it, I, I have no problem realizing Satan and his force and sin within our lives, that we were born blind. All these things just say, yeah, they, they set well with me. But then the idea that God stiffens, that just is hard for me that he would take his sovereignty and harden the heart of someone that I know he loves, he created. Well, we've still not answered that. We've still not answered, does God harden hearts? I'm sticking you, but you guys aren't answering me. You see, that's my, that's my point up here. Mm -hmm. I have an answer for everything I'm asking you. I'm just waiting for somebody to answer it. Yeah. Right? And then, but it seems to me in the passages that we read this morning is that the hardening is as a result of turning from the truth, rejecting the truth. And that's when God says, okay. If this is what you want, here's what you can have. Uh, aren't you glad that, are you, are you not glad that, that, that God has not answered all of your prayers? Right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think it's okay to struggle with those things. Because, like, the Lord knows. Like, that's, that's that thing of, like, we want to put God in a box and be like, no, God doesn't do anything that ever makes me uncomfortable. And it's like, no, God, by definition of being God, does things that makes me uncomfortable. But kind of like what Kathy was saying, too, like, I almost wonder that, because I think we tend to, like, isolate these things of, like, oh, well, is this person's heart hardened because of sin? Or is it hardened because the Lord is hardening it? Or is it, you know, but... I think all those verses are there because, like, maybe the Lord knows the proportions and stuff. But I think all those things kind of work together, too, like she was saying. Like, you chose this, which is what we all choose, right? Like Ephesians 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. There's no hope for any of us. But it makes me think of, like, Isaiah 42, that Jesus came to open the eyes of the blind and to free the captives. You know what I mean? And that's, like... But here's the problem. If God wants everybody saved, why doesn't he do that to everybody? I don't know. It's a question for God, I guess. <laughs> do, you see, do you see the fallacy there? If God wants everybody to be saved, then there, why is there so much hardening? Why is there hardening from God? Why is there hardening from sin? Why is there har hardening everywhere? If God wants everybody to be saved, and there's no, no problem, right? Uh, listen to Ephesians chapter 2. I just was thinking of this verse. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. This is verse 1. Verse 2 says, In which you formerly walked in this world according to the ruler of the power of the air. Now, who is that? The spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Does that scare you? Romans chapter 11, verse 25 says this, For I do not want you, brothers, to be uninformed of this mystery. There's, there's a good term to look up, sometime do a study on. So that you will not be wise in your own estimation, but a pardoning has happened to Israel until the fullness of the time, Gentiles comes in. And that's Luke 21, 24. And so that's, that's kind of the question that we're still asking. We want to know, is God hardening through sin, allowing sin to harden people, allowing Satan to harden people, or is he actively hardening? I'll give you one more verse, and then we'll do uh, a couple slides here. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and let me start in verse 7. Okay, verse 7 of Second Thessalonians chapter 2. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. There's, there's someone who is restraining the Antichrist. And then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming, whose coming is in accord with working of, the working of Satan with all power, signs, and false wonders. This, the same terminology is used of Christ who did power, signs, and wonders, and with all of the deception of unrighteousness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. And for this reason, 
God sends them, sends upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. God sends upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. That doesn't sound like God wants all of them to be saved. What do you think? I mean, I have a problem with that, but I can't deny it because that's what I'm reading over and over again. Now, let me re- give you one more verse, Romans chapter 9, and this maybe this will help you uh, concerning this hardening. Romans 9, 22 and 23, we'll read them both. We have brought this out before. It's been brought out several times. But in verse 22, he says this, And what if God, wanting to demonstrate his wrath and make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath, having been prepared for destruction, and in order the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory? That first verb in 22 is passive. It's from an outside source, right? Um, God, God doesn't harden them. They are already hard. They are already deaf. They're already dead. They're already blind. They're already enslaved. They are being hardening because of sin. They are being hardening because of Satan. And God is using those things to further harden them. The question is, what has God done with Israel? Did Israel become totally hardened uh, at at their crucifying of the, of the Christ. And that's what we want to know. Is that going to come up, you think, or not? Is it? Oh, okay, good. I think he had a, do you have a question back there? I have a comment on what you're uh, talking about. Okay. I don't think that he totally hardened Israel's heart. I think what he did is through all their teachings over the year, and if you know any Jews, they, uh, who are, Orthodox, oh, they reject Christ completely because of their teaching. They think he's a Roman Catholic God. I mean, they're they're like so deluded through false teaching. I think God will open their eyes, like you just read the passage after the time of the Gentiles. And so I think that he's setting them aside and letting them wander aimlessly until after every Gentile is saved, and then he's going to bring a remnant back because they're his people. Yeah. Uh, William E. Blackstone, I don't know if you know anything about him. I'm not going to go into a big history lesson. You can look him up. <clears throat> if you want to, he died in 1935. Okay, 1935. You know what happened in 1948, right? Israel declared itself a nation, an independent, sovereign nation. Before he died, Israel's God's sundial. If anyone desires to know our place in God's chronology, our position in the great march of events, look at Israel. There was no Israel. But he knew what the Bible taught. And he knew there had to be a future for Israel. Just to kind of give you some thoughts there. Now, there, there, are, some, there are some people who believe that um, the church has replaced Israel, right? And uh, I don't say this to their discredit. I have books by these people. But just to give you some of the thoughts, here's Justin Martyr in his dialogue. Therefore, from the one man Jacob, who was surnamed Israel, all your nation has been called Jacob and Israel. So we from Christ, who began unto God, like Jacob and Israel and Judah, Joseph and David are called uh, and are the true sons of God, keep the commandments of Christ, as therefore Christ is the Israel, the Jacob, even so we who have been quarried out of Christ are the true Israelitic race. So we've replaced Israel. There's no more future for national Israel. After their dispersion, then they come back, they reconstitute themselves a nation, 1948, What does that mean to people like this? Nothing. Yes, Dave, hang on just a second. Yeah, just a question. When did Justin Martyr write that? Uh, I do not know. I could look it up. I mean, what century? Uh, 
Probably third or fourth. I'm not sure. Uh, so about the time of that's Augustine, a guess. Like about Augustine's time, or Augustine's fourth century. So okay. uh, yeah, just before. I think it's before, oh, okay. but I'm not certain. I could look that up though. Does anybody know? Come on. You would guess with me, <laughs> so we're both wrong probably. <coughs> Kenneth Gentry who is very big on replacement theology, writes this. That is, we believe in the unfolding plan of God in history, the Christian church, is the very fruition of the redemption purpose of God. As such, the multiracial international church of Jesus Christ supersedes racial as the focus of the kingdom of God. Indeed, we believe the church becomes the Israel of God. You say, well, I don't really read him. What about R.C.? We believe the church is essentially Israel. We believe that the answer to what about this? Here we are. We are together. The Israel of God. Princes with God. The ecclesia. The set apart ones. Right? Even little statements that you don't really catch maybe in your reading such as this one by John Piper. <coughs> Excuse me. God is for Israel. All Israel will someday turn to the Lord as a group. This is my deep understanding and belief of Romans 11. The broken off branches will be grafted in one day to the people of God, the bride of Christ, his church. Now, what's wrong with that statement? He's denying any future regeneration and regathering of the nation of Israel. He's saying Israel has become part of the church. That's the program for Israel. Did you have a question, Carrie, or were you waving at me? Looked it up. Justin Martyr says uh, live from AD 100 to 165. All right. Thank you, Carrie. So when we get into the covenant, you'll understand this a little bit more. But for right now, let me just at least give you this. Jeremiah 31, this is right after the giving of the new covenant. This is what the Lord says. If the heavens can... Uh, Above can be measured in the fountains, foundations of the earth searched out below. Then I will also reject all the descendants of Israel for everything that they have done, declares the Lord. So the question is, what has done that has caused God to not only harden them, but to do away with them having any purpose of a future chastening, future uh, kingdom and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. So just, just a quick note, and I think this is probably implied in the thing you had from Piper there, but um, as we've said before, there are some, just so we're aware, who do believe that the church has replaced Israel, but that there still is a future for ethnic Israel and God's, God's plan. So there is kind of an in-between view there of like somewhere like, yeah, it's completely like no future for Israel whatsoever. Church has replaced Israel and others hold kind of a middle position. The church has replaced Israel, but Israel still has a purpose in God's, God's plan. Yes. And the, the only reason I didn't bring out this because there's so many distinctions. These are what you would call replacement theologians. They believe that the church has replaced Israel indefinitely. But then there are other perspectives that believe that there is still a future for a national, regathered, regenerate, reestablished Israel who will be in a literal messianic kingdom. So uh, being a, a, a person that I <coughs> don't necessarily know that I have a, 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 a firm stance on, you know, whether the church has replaced Israel or, you know, you know, the other argument. But I can't help, like, when I see a statement, you know, by John Piper, the one that you just showed, is like, at, in my process of trying to figure this out, I suppose, it makes more sense to me, only because I'm also somewhat familiar with the, uh, the argument of, you know, two separate Gospels, one for the Jews, one for the Gentiles. And I, from what I've looked into that, I completely reject that. But as I read that statement from John Piper, it seems to me to make more sense than the other side. I'm not sure exactly what you said other than the two gospel part. What do you mean by that? The, the, <coughs> what I mean by the 
to yeah, I'm not sure what you mean. So there was an, I, 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 there was apparently, I don't know how long ago. I'm terrible with dates and stuff like that, but there came about where there was an argument that was presented that there's actually two separate gospels, and that some of the disciples were responsible for this one, and that some of the disciples were responsible for this one, and one was <coughs> for the Gentiles, and one was for uh, the Jews, and that they were you know, basically, in other words, if you're a Jew, this part of the this this part of the gospel or Jesus or whatever was for you, and if you're a Gentile, then this one is for you. How many Gospels do you think there are? One. Okay. I'm glad you said one. <laughs> I was going to... Well, Could saying, the elders please come forward <laughs> and speak well, to Jim? Well, but the point is, like, it was actually, I wouldn't have done that. It was, it, it was a very short-lived argument, apparently, because it was disfunct, <coughs> uh, basically dismissed, dismissed in the, I don't know, theological realm or something like that. But some people still hold to it. My, my former stepdad was one of them. Like him and I had a big, huge falling out about it, I guess, or at least that's what it turned into me. Anyway, what I'm saying is, like, according to what I have learned, and I, you know, which probably is just a scratch on the sur surface of what it really is, but what I'm saying is, from what I have learned about that whole argument of two separate gospels, um, what John Piper just said in his statement that you just showed, for me, just makes more sense rather than there being. Because I, I just fear that there's on the, if you are saying, well, you know, there's still a massive distinction between the church and Israel as a nation, then to me, and I could be wrong about this, I'm not saying that it is, but it seems like it, that bodes towards the two separate gospels to me, as in, as in the argument I, I stated. All right, back in the back, back there. That last uh, slide you had about, I think it was Piper, um, said about Israel being grafted back in to the tree of the church. Now, that's the way I view it. Uh, there's still Israel, but if you, when you read Revelation, it's a new Jerusalem coming down. So everything else is destroyed. So how can there be people saying, well, there's going to be a nation of Israel? If we're all Israel at that point, but there are going to be a big remnant of that are going to be grafted back in. And the churches I used to go to, we always called ourselves adopted Jews. As Christians, we are adopted Jews. I think their thinking was that we we're accepted by God into his family because Israel was traditionally his chosen people. And so he chosen <laughs> us too, and Israel will... Eventually, their eyes will open and a remnant will join and be grafted into the church. Hmm. It's interesting, the most, the most talked about time period in the Bible is the most spiritualized and neglected part of the Bible, and that's the tribulation. Everybody wants to make it some mystical period of time without taking the literalness of it. It's kind of interesting. Let me leave you with uh, this last part. This is the final hardening. Now, early in history, there have been several stages of prophetic visions, of um, prophetic ministries. Moses did signs, remember? God called him and he did signs in Egypt and he judged the people. Elijah did signs. They came along and they performed signs. Validating God's message to the people, right? Jesus came along, and Jesus did signs and said, these are the messianic signs, right? The disciples came along, and they did signs. But did you know there's one more period of time that the Bible talks about there being signs? And it's a future part uh, of history, and it's a demonically hardening signs, it's demonically hardening signs. Did you hear me? It's not positive. It's negative. It's only going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Okay? Matthew chapter 24. Let me just give you a handful of verses. Real quick here. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 24. Again, several of these I've read. For false Christs and false prophets will arise, show great signs and wonders, 
so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Even the elect. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9 again, who's talking about this world leader whose coming is in accord with the working of Satan. That's Ephesians 2.2. 2, with all power, signs, and false wonders. By the way, notice all of these false prophets in Christ who are coming. They're performing signs. What do you do with that? You think they're real signs? You think they're fake signs? They are performing signs, right? So you have to deal with that issue again. Mark 13 and verse 22, false Christ, false prophets will arise, show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. Let me give you a couple more. Revelation 13, excuse me, Revelation 13 and verse 13 And he does great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of the heavens to the earth in the presence of man. This is the false prophet and how he can make fire fall from heaven. That's pretty amazing, right? Uh, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20. And of course we know that Satan's the master deceiver and you find that phrase all throughout the scripture, but... Chapter 19 there in uh, verse 20, the beast was seized and with him the false prophet who did signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And when we look in the scriptures, I mean it's so crystal clear, all of us have sinned. That's what the Bible tells us when we read there. All of us have sinned. When we look further into the Bible and we start studying the Bible, and I know some probably would not agree with the the statement or use this statement, but you see it several times. Uh, Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. You see passages like uh, Romans 11 and verse 5, chapter 5 and verse 5. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all workers of iniquity. All sin will be punished. The wages of sin is death. But God tells us that the free gift is eternal life through his son. The perfect life that he lived, the Bible says he lived holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. He lived a perfect life that pleased God in everything that he did. He was our advocate. He's our sort of our mediator. He's our substitute. He sits at the right hand of the Father and ever lives to intercede for us. The book of Romans tells us. The book of Hebrew tells us. And 1 John 2, 1 tells us that. And we're told then in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Just read that for you. But as many, talking about Jesus, but as many as received him, that is the perfect life he lived, substitutionary death he died, To them, he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood or of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but were born of God. See that? And that's the good news for this morning. Does God actively harden? It seems as though God is part of the hardening, but he uses sin and Satan and other things to harden people. Can those people ever come back to faith? What do you think? Dave? I know this is the question Dave's been wanting to know. Uh, I think so. I think Paul was hardened uh, until until the Damascus Road. Um, I mean, he obviously, he hated Christ. He hated Christians. He hated, and where did that come from? Manasseh, Nebuchadnezzar, others of... Uh, there's indications of others who have been in that situation and come to faith in Christ. So I was just going to say that I really struggled with that for a long time, <coughs> just thinking that I serve a God who hardens people and then sends them to hell for hardening their hearts. But something really stood, stood out to me in Exodus that um, just turned my eyes of the way I see God through that. And it says... Um, 
and verse chapter 7, verse 3, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh will not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my host, my people, the sons of Israel, from the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. And it just gave me a whole, like, um, understanding of God, when he hardens people's heart, he did that so the whole nation of Israel would see that he is the Lord. So, like, when he's hardening some, he's also opening the eyes of a whole nation by hardening Pharaoh's heart. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I think sometimes we, we just see that one that's hardened. We don't see God has the right to do that, you know. But in him doing that, his reasoning was very clear. He was going to show that entire nation who he was. And they would know that he's the Lord in the midst of all their idols, you know. And the other thing is, I get to the point where, like the apostles said, you know, like, where else are we going to go, Lord? So if we struggle with, you know, that being, that if, is God mean? Is he just in doing these things, you know? I mean, we just have to, I get to the place where I'm like, you know what, I'm going to trust in God's goodness, that even though he hardened Pharaoh's heart, he did that for a massive good. And, you know, Pharaoh had it coming. It's easy to, to see in scripture. It's harder to see if it's your family, you know. But I think that's where when we are feeling that way, we have to say, are we going to go too because we're offended? You know, are we going to stay with the Lord and say, you know what? We're going to trust in the things we don't understand. We're going to trust the Lord, you know. Yeah, Beckna, back. Um, the part that says, like, even the elect are led astray, w is that, like, during the tribulation? They said or? they were not, if possible, oh, to lead. If possible, to if lead. If possible, okay. Yeah, they wouldn't lead the elect. I was uh, like, wait a second. Yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't lead the elect astray, or you'd have a big problem there, right? Yeah, Pastor. That's a good question, though. Just kind of two resources I want to recommend to folks that want to dig deeper on, on this. Um, the first one, like when, when you're talking about can people who have been hardened, you know, come, actually come to faith down the road. A, a lot of times people use Hebrews, especially Hebrews 6. You know, those who have once been enlightened have tasted of the heavenly gift. It's impossible to restore again them to repentance. And they're like, okay, well, wait a minute. You know, uh, can someone who's been exposed to Christ and his church and, and then leaves, can they ever come back? and and, and they'll say, well, I, I don't think so. And that's a real confusing passage. I think Tom Schreiner's book on that is extremely helpful. It's called Running the Race to Win. I believe that's the name of it. But regardless, it's a Tom Schreiner book on that passage. Very helpful with this question. The other thing is, is if you're looking to dig into more of Israel and the church, Four Perspectives on Israel and the Church by Chad Brand. I would highly recommend it. Um, it it'll explain the dispensational view, the covenant view. And then it'll explain progressive dispensationalism and progressive covenantalism. So there are various views in between and on each end of the spectrum, as Jeff said. This book's super helpful. 